Okay, I'm going to assume that you're all here in our Zoom. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Lizzie O'Shea. I'm the Chair of Digital Rights Watch. Uh, before we get started with this Zoom session, I'd just like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional owners and custodian of the lands on which we're all coming together today, wherever that may be. Uh, the country we now call Australia was built on stolen lands of hundreds of unique Indigenous nations, and we acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so my name's Lizzie, as I said, um, I am the Chair of Digital Rights Watch, who is the host of today's webinar. Digital Rights Watch exists to defend and promote fairness, freedoms and fundamental rights for all Australians in the digital world. Uh, our mission is to equip, empower and enable all Australians and our communities to uphold their digital rights. We do this by building alliances across civil society, raising public awareness through the media, participating in policy development within government and also talking to industry. And we're trying to create a world where there's a strong and diverse movement of advocates capable of holding government and industry to, to account for their policy decisions. So we've put on this event today, uh, which is framed around the campsite rule. So the idea that we would leave a campsite better than we found it, how do we emerge from a crisis with stronger respect for human rights, especially when it comes to digital rights issues? And that's the framing of the discussion today. Um, we're here to talk about how digital rights issues come to the fore in times of crisis, how we can be strategic advocates to make sure human rights are protected, and also to build a sense of community, to say hi to each other, especially in a time of isolation like now, uh, when we're all in our homes. Uh, and we are also keen to kind of build that sense of community over time. So this, we hope, will be one of many events. If you like it, then feel free to share your feedback with us. Uh, we're keen to stay in touch with our members and our community to make sure we're doing work uh, that reflects your interests and engagement. I should say that this event is designed to be public. So we are intending to record it for publication on our website. The idea being that people who might not have been able to come today can look at it later. If that's a cause for concern for you, you're welcome to get in touch, uh, but please be mindful of that when you're participating in the forum today. I'm just going to introduce some of our speakers uh, and we'll probably talk for about half an hour or so, a little bit longer. Uh, and after that, there'll be time for discussion. Uh, and you are able to ask questions yourself uh, to the right. If you've used them for, before, I'm sure you'll know there is a chat box um, provided that you list all, uh, you select all panellists and attendees from the drop down menu. Those questions will be visible and we'll be able to work through them and hopefully present as many as we can to the panellists. Uh, so feel free to to put questions there um, for discussion amongst all of us. Um, but why don't I introduce our speakers and then we can get started. So, um, Dr. Heron Loban is a Torres Strait Islander woman with family connections to Mabuag and Boigu. Dr. Loban is an academic, former lawyer and expert in Indigenous law and justice issues, and she's currently an academic based at Griffith University in Brisbane. Vanessa Teague is a cryptographer and the CEO of Thinking Cybersecurity, as well as an adjunct associate professor at the ANU Research School of Computer Science. Vanessa is well known for her work in secure electronic voting, privacy and re-identification of open data, as well as more recently on preserving privacy in relation to contact tracing technology. Scott Ludlam is a writer, activist and former Australian Green Senator. He served as the party spokesperson on communication, campaigning and internet filtering, data retention, mass surveillance and broader digital rights issues. Um, her, his first book on ecology, technology and politics will be published any year now, pandemic permitting. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, there's two clear crises that have been presented by uh, recent months, one of which of course is the COVID-19 crisis and the requirement to stay at home. Uh, and the other of course is the wave of protests around the world, addressing questions of racism, of police brutality, and here in Australia of deaths in custody and over-policing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Now, technology is a tool that has been used by both companies and governments to respond to some of these problems and also uh, exploit opportunities. And the question is, Problems and opportunities for who? And what does this mean? So I thought to get this conversation started, we might 
talk to each of the panelists one by one to let them introduce themselves, to give them a sentence or two just about a particular digital rights issue that they think has arisen in response to one of these crises or perhaps something else that we ought to keep in mind. So perhaps let's start with Vanessa. So I'm a geek. I've been looking primarily at privacy and data around the COVID Safe app. And although there are some good things about uh, automated contact tracing, there are also some things to be concerned about. So in particular, I think the thing that's new about everybody wandering around with an app like this is the potential for everybody's phone to now contain a list of all of the people that you've been really right close to in a way that is potentially available to centralised authorities to read. That might not be a big deal for many Australians, but it might be a big deal for some. And I think that we need to think about it and to understand exactly what it is. Great. Heron, what kind of crisis do you think we need to be mindful of in digital rights issue as it presents in that particular way? Sorry, just so yeah. Look, I think uh, you know, as an Indigenous woman, uh, I've sort of been watching both uh, very closely because there have been some very particular implications for particular remote Indigenous communities and uh, their sort of health protection, but also conveying messages to those communities and how does that happen in a safe way when isolation needs to occur. But obviously, Indigenous deaths in custody as well. That technology has provided sort of uh, you know, a new opportunity to capture on camera and to capture digitally and share across the world what otherwise might not have been revealed through government sources, government reports, you know, and the like. So, uh, so I suppose it is most definitely the opportunity, but also balancing that with any other sort of uh, concerns or constraints that might be presented by technology as well. Terrific. I think Scott's having a tiny bit of trouble with audio. So what I might do while I see if we can get that sorted is start then with you, Vanessa. Let's talk about COVID particularly and perhaps contact tracing. How can we ensure that the solutions that we create in this context, the potential for technology to assist with uh, contact tracing to stop the spread of a virus, for example, of which there is potential, how can we make sure that it's not then used for other purposes that we might regret later? <laughs> right. Well, I don't know the answer to that question, uh, but I have some suggestions. So first of all, uh, we can't really ensure that things that are gathered aren't misused later. I think one principle that I would really like to see applied across the board and not just for COVID safe or not just for contact tracing is the idea that there's a set of basic principles and ideas around a democratic society and you don't get to just forget about them because you're using technology to do it. So in particular, uh, we've seen with the robo debt scandal, for example, that a technology was used, but it was used to do a thing that would have been outrageous, even if it hadn't been technological anyway. They were computing a thing that was wrong. They were sending out a bunch of letters that were not, not fair and not right. Uh, the fact that they were doing that in an automated way didn't actually change anything fundamental about it, except that the automation was, uh, they tried to use it as an excuse to sort of make okay something that was not okay. So if we look at uh, COVID safe, I don't think it's inherently doing anything that wouldn't be okay. But I also think that it should be treated with the same kind of skepticism that other kinds of data gathering would also be right it shouldn't get a it shouldn't get a excuse from the expectations of open democratic analysis and participation nor from the requirements of our very strong privacy guarantees just because it's a fancy new thing that runs on an app so with that in mind i think it's really interesting to see the way that the discussion and debate has unfolded around it right it's it's a fundamentally new thing. And in the early days, I'm going to share this fantastic tweet. This is a tweet from Lizzie saying, um, 
it was set up very much as uh, a thing that we were all, we were all encouraged. This is my screen share. We were all encouraged to do it as if, you know, it was released on Anzac Day, you know, the great and glorious fallen soldiers wanted us to download it and so forth. And Lizzie, I think, quite rightly wrote, this is becoming a propaganda war. Uh, we had, uh, and it doesn't say, I think this is really significant, it doesn't say Beck Judd has thought about it carefully and she has some uh, interesting analysis to contribute to public debate. It says Beck Judd shuts down COVID safe app skeptics. So this managed to press all of my buttons in one tweet, basically, because if there's anything that is the antithesis of democracy, it's the idea of shutting down uh, skepticism in public discussion. So what actually happened in this propaganda war is we won. Uh, and we won not by forcing the app to become some other thing, but by having an open, interesting, transparent public discussion. Here's my second screen share, which is just one example. Um, this is Jim Masarad, who's a Bluetooth developer. And he's saying, you know, actually, you should definitely install today's update because it's got a couple of important fixes that I notified the DTA about a while ago. And this was just the beginning of just the most fantastic open public discussion I have ever seen about any technical thing in Australia in the decade that I've been doing geek stuff and democracy in this country. What has followed over the last few weeks has been this tremendous completely grassroots, spontaneous, open, free analysis of this thing. It's resulted in a bunch of important bugs being fixed, both privacy bugs and functionality bugs. Uh, and it's really grounded this really important political discussion in uh, facts about what the thing actually is. So we won the propaganda war with reason and geek detail and evidence and logic. So I think this is a really good news story. That's interesting. I sort of regret now not inviting Beck Judd to participate in this panel because it would have been very satisfying to um, feel that way because it was very troubling, I think, to watch people talk about this app almost with magical um, awe for what it was capable of, capable of without necessarily um, asking what it was designed to do and, and looking behind how it was presented to us. Um, Heron, I wanted to go to you because some of the things that Vanessa talked about, um, people having trust and faith in technology as, as doing what it says it does, is also a way in which technology can be profoundly useful as a tool for accountability and justice. And you mentioned in some of your opening remarks talking about how um, technology has been used in this way in some of the movements against racism and police brutality. I mean, part of the reason I think that this um, protest movement really started was that George Floyd's death was caught on camera uh, in a way that made it really difficult to ignore. And um, I wanted to see if uh, we could tease that out because of course there are considerations we need to keep uh, in mind when uh, talking about how technology can be both used against people who are from poor and minority backgrounds, but also used by them as a tool for justice. What do you think the sorts of things are that we need to think about there? Yeah, it's I mean, it's really interesting just to pick up on your point about people taking film is that for many, for quite a few years, I'd say the last five or so years, a lot of um, courts and coronial inquests where an Indigenous person has, have died in custody have said police need to turn on their police cams that are on their sort of um, chests, but often they don't. And so there's been a real desire to capture these things, but a reliance on sort of government, government institutions and government workers to do that. And if they don't, well, then the absence of the video is there. But I think there's uh, probably a couple of things in respect of uh, Indigenous people, which I think extend to other marginalised groups as well. So the first thing is access to the technology. So there is an equitable access to telecommunications infrastructure across all of Australia. So in remote uh, rural Australia and some regional parts, um, access to whether it's mobile, you know, towers or whether it's other kind of infrastructure just isn't there. So if the government's going to roll out information 
or services through the use of an app. Well, if you can't access the app physically, then how is it going to be any use? And that's going to perhaps have the impact of excluding certain parts of our community, uh, which might then, of course, cause a health risk. So that's that's kind of the first thing that, that comes to mind that's, that really needs to be addressed. The second thing is, are the apps appropriate for all the sort of the breadth and width of community members and community groups that we have? Not everyone has English as a first language. Not everyone has a smartphone. Some people have the old flip phones. So, you know, things need to be fit for purpose. Otherwise, there's no point. You're going to have some people that simply can't access the technology uh, because it's not culturally appropriate or physically appropriate. So there's sort of probably two sort of type telecommunications consumer uh, issues that that I would see. And I think the last sort of aspect that's perhaps a little bit, uh, has been a bit troubling for some years is that uh, in terms of policy around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we've had this policy called uh, compulsory income management. And all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that live in certain parts, and it has extended to non-Indigenous communities as well now, have these cards where all of 50 to 80% of their Centrelink entitlements are placed. And uh, originally it was the basics card, which was a government issued card, but now there's a new card called the Inju card. And that's run by a private company. So this private company is now collecting all sorts of information about people's spending habits, where they spend, what they spend it on. And if people want to buy certain things, they also have to get permission to use the card for that particular purpose. So what is meant to be, you know, a social security uh, benefit and a safety net has become an opportunity for the private sector to collect information about people's spending habits. And I think that's quite troubling. Uh, and perhaps a lot of people aren't aware of that. And that's something the government is seeking to roll out further. So I think that's a real data privacy issue as well that we've seen start in the Indigenous community, but it's being rolled out much more broadly to the wider Australian population. So I think they're probably some of the things that I see are issues for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but increasingly the whole of the Australian sort of population. Um, terrific. I think Scott might still be struggling a little bit, so I might come back to you, Vanessa, I think it's interesting to frame this discussion as, uh, or this period in terms of COVID safe as kind of like a success, because I think often as digital rights activists, it can feel like we're failing a lot of the time. Uh, big policy decisions are made and implemented, often without consulting um, civil society, certainly in relation to things like robo debt and the basics card, these kinds of large projects that involve invasion of people's privacy and restrictions using technical capabilities. Uh, it can be immensely frustrating when those communities aren't given uh, the voice to be able to talk about it or engage with the policy development. Mm. When it comes to technology, I think it's really interesting that in relation to this COVID app, there were a lot of engaged technical people raising questions, developing ideas, working through the kinds of problems that we have. How can we make sure, what kinds of rules should we be looking for? Things like, should stuff always be open source? Should it always be available for scrutiny by experts? How do we bring experts into the fold? How do we also consult with users to make sure that there's both expertise and um, user experience considered in these projects? What kinds of things are you looking for, Vanessa, when it comes to large scale government technology projects to make sure that we're doing it right? Yes, okay. Well, first of all, let me just agree entirely with what Heron just said, this idea that a private company compulsorily gets all your spending and um, details of what you bought is just foul. <laughs> so I couldn't agree more that that's an example of something very, very badly done. Uh, particularly given our very lax laws about the sharing of weekly de-identified data, right? That's going to be very easily re-identifiable and yet probably not very appropriately protected uh, data. Um, but to go back to Lizzie's question, what should, we, what should we be demanding about technology and what should we come to expect about how uh, technology like the COVID-Safe app is... is um, 
described to the public on its way out. Uh, I think, well, I think what you said is exactly right. It should be open, right? Again, there's nothing, um, there's nothing new about the idea that government decisions should be as open as possible to public scrutiny. It's got nothing to do with technology in particular. It's just that there's a recent tradition that technological solutions are somehow exempt from this idea that we've always had that government decisions in a democracy should be open to public scrutiny. And we get this rubbish excuse that, uh, you know, we're, we're keeping the source code secret to protect your to protect your privacy is the new one, which I've heard this year, right? It used to be, oh, we're keeping it secret for security reasons. Now, ridiculously, it's, oh, we're keeping it secret to protect your privacy, which is pure nonsense. And you can see that the analysis that's been done around the COVID Safe app has significantly improved privacy for many of the people who are using the app because a lot of bugs that have been found have been privacy bugs. And if they'd been able to keep the details of its functioning secret, then a lot of the privacy bugs that have now been fixed would not have been found. Uh, in exactly the same way, if they were to make the server code openly available, then the same community of people could probably do the same kind of quality job of finding similar kinds of errors or weaknesses on the server side, and they could be improved as well. Uh, if they have nothing to fear, then they have no reason to hide it from us. And so this potential both to fix stuff that up that is obviously a bug and also to explain to people what it's really doing seems to me to be just an absolutely fundamental part of democracy so i've talked about fixing bugs the other really important thing that's come out of this open analysis of uh, COVID safe is some discrepancies between what we were told it was doing and what it really was actually doing. So for example, many Australians are under the misconception that it only records very close contacts, that is less than 1.5 metres, uh, for a relatively long time, that is more than 15 minutes. And if you read the FAQ without a, a particular mindset, it certainly leaves you with the impression that that is the case. Uh, of course, it's not the case, actually. There, there's nothing in the app that is even capable of figuring out who is within one and a half metres, and, and there's nothing in it that bothers uh, making sure that it's only recording long contacts either. So, in addition to fixing bugs, we're also able to look at the code and say to individuals who are making decisions about whether or not to use it, that it doesn't do necessarily exactly what they might have thought. Now, for many people, it's probably not a showstopper, but if you were thinking that you would uh, go to the psychiatrist and leave your phone two metres away from them, or if you're a Chinese student hanging out with some Hong Kong pro-democracy protesters and you thought that that uh, contact wouldn't be recorded if you talked to them for less than 15 minutes, you need to know that in fact it's recording everything. So I think there are three really important things that happen. One is bugs get fixed. Two is people get accurately informed about what it's actually doing so the individuals can make a decision about it. And the third is that the public debate and discussion about it can be informed by a real understanding of what's happening. And in particular, many countries are grappling with trying to decide between a centralised solution based on uploading a list of your encrypted contacts to your government versus a decentralised solution uh, around the Apple Google API that will simply notify people of their exposure directly without centralising the database uh, in government. So in answer to your question, we should demand more of that every time, right? Every time mm -hmm. something new is rolled out, whether it's digital ID, whether it's um, whatever, electronic voting, God forbid, but oh, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that, but you know, whether, whether, whatever it is, it should be subject to exactly the same kind of open scrutiny that we'd expect from anything in a democracy. Yeah, because while it's easy to talk about um, opening up the source of something like COVID safe, actually there's lots of government programs that rely on automated systems that uh, can be more open. And obviously that's a technical question, but it can also be a legal one, for example, you know, the Australian Human Rights Commission's report on technology and human rights, their discussion paper talks about making decisions understandable when they're made with the assistance of AI and um, welfare recipients, for example, are a good, um, set of people who might wish to do that if a decision's been made about them denying a benefit or otherwise. I'm just going to see if I can bring Scott in um, because the technology gods um, needed a bit of appeasing there. But uh, can we hear you, Scott? 
Well, I hope so. I can hear you. You are. Again, it's um, it's because Vanessa has been talking all about how important open source is. We've we've made our offering. Um, can Scott? Can I perhaps get you started on uh, perhaps offering some insight into how policymakers and lawmakers make these kinds of decisions? I think one of the questions that activists often say is that politicians perhaps don't understand the technical implications of what they might be doing, um, and that if we educate them, then they might come to terms with why their position is not. Correct correct what do you think about framing it in that way i think there's definitely uh cases in my experience where that's been true where politicians have tried to do something that's just te technically going to be a disaster and then the politics of the way that the the issue is debated um tend to be shaped by technology discussions and in a way i think the internet filter campaign was that where you could see the government announce something without this is going back away i realize but without really understanding what the technology would and wouldn't allow them to do data retention i think in a similar way we got bogged down in conversations about what is and isn't metadata um, so i think some of it is definitely an ignorance question but then the stuff that worries me more is where they know exactly what they're doing so this new azo bill or everything that's surrounding the facial recognition technology that they're trying to lace together this extraordinary database of biometric information that would be able to track people literally down the street like they can in some parts of China. That's not based on technical ignorance. That's pure malice. They know exactly what the technology is capable of and they're attempting to push it in that direction. So I think we've got to weigh up both. There's definitely, because these systems are so complex, there's definitely a place there for raising awareness. But often it's just brute politics and power accumulation that drives these things rather than naivety. Thanks. So also like, I want to come back to you here and to talk a little bit more about um, this idea of um, also minority sections of society having technology experimented on. Because one of the things that does seem to happen in a crisis or at least um, uh, perhaps in advance, but then is generalised, is things are tested on communities, um, often Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, who maybe don't want something, but then it is generalised and applied elsewhere. And income management is one example of that, where it's been used elsewhere. Um, but it started um, uh, being tested on and used on Aboriginal people. And it does sort of suggest that we absolutely need to mobilise around protecting people's rights, even when it's a small group of people that might be um, having this imposed upon them. Um, is that your read of things? What is the best strategy in terms of dealing with um, how governments set up these projects and then how we can try and arrest them before they become uh, a, a more widespread practice? Yeah, look, we always, we sort of joke, but we're being serious. We say that we're always the government's guinea pigs and we're always seem to be part of a failed experiment and we're always being experimented on because it feels like we're living a real life experiment with new policies or new programs. And I think that's a fair actual um, statement to make. Uh, you know, I am, I have a legal background. And so, you know, one of the things that I do think is that the law and the use of the law can be a tool to provide some protections. Uh, there, I think, is a bit of a lag in terms of the framework that we have around dealing with, for example, digital platforms and, and people's digital literacy uh, and understanding. And so I think there is uh, a real value in people understanding that when we're looking at at rights that we're not just looking at rights that can be mobilized or enforced for certain groups of people so small groups of people like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or uh, uh, you know homeless people or victims of domestic violence that oftentimes the rights that we might look at in just sort of in the context of a uh, very sort of specific or narrow frame actually can have wider benefits for the whole community but it's just that they often get raised in the context of that particular group of people on that policy or program. So I think, and as you mentioned, income management is a classic example. It started out as, oh, well, it's only Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, only in the Northern Territory. And all of a sudden now it's got a bit of momentum and the momentum gets harder and harder to stop the faster and quicker it rolls. And that is kind of where we are at the moment that, uh, 
despite the best efforts of some of my colleagues doing research and saying that there isn't any proof that there are benefits to income management and collecting data and uh, through these different programs that the government is not necessarily interested in making changes to policy even where the research demonstrates the policy is a failure. So I think we do have to be very rigorous and a bit strident as well in our push back on policies when they're small and contained and just the thin end of, edge of the wedge before uh, things get a little bit harder to, uh, uh, I suppose, contain through instruments like the law and through the courts, which, which is not uncommon. Yeah. Mm. And it's certainly not an issue, I don't think that's going away as well. Um, the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty released a report at the end of last year talking about the digitisation of the welfare state in various places around the world and how projects around digital identity were being rolled out that were quite invasive and linking people to um, you know, a, vast, a vast network of essentially scrutiny and surveillance associated with accessing welfare programs. So treating welfare recipients as people who have to pay with their privacy to be able to access these programs rather than as people with inherent rights and dignity that uh, need to be provided for by our, our society collectively. Um, it does strike me though that this idea of crisis comes back all the time. So it's either a crisis, a health crisis that might justify invasive technology. It might be something like the intervention that happened in the Northern Territory justifying all these um, special measures uh, to be applied to Aboriginal people which become more widespread. I did want to bring you in, Scott, actually, because how do we kind of um, take back some of the power in these contexts in which this rhetoric is very powerful? Uh, the obvious one that comes to mind as well in recent lawmaking is the threat of terrorism and this very severe crisis that we face that does require legislative action or policy reform. What things are politicians scared of in this context that we can start to, um, to use to our advantage to, to build a culture of rights protection um, that politicians might feel that there's a consequence associated with not paying respect to human rights in their policy making? Wow, well, I think that's exactly the right way to frame the question because at the moment they're not scared of us. I think what they are scared of is when we get organised, which is, to my mind, why they spend such a lot of time and energy and resources keeping us divided and scrapping at each other. I think whatever we are able to do to get organised outside of our silos, you know, the worst thing that could happen is that we end up in a digital rights community where we talk to each other about digital rights. Uh, without, as, you're, as we're already seeing, kind of branching out into the broader human rights framework to talk to climate organisers, to be helping to empower people who are being attacked and who are on the front line of some of these programs. So to my mind, it is all about being organised and about supporting each other. The tech community, the developer community, some of the folk who are likely on this call have a huge amount to offer. Other organizers, other groups, um, other people on the front line who are, who are the ones having this technology applied to them. Uh, we saw, and this goes back years, so um, Asha Wolf, I don't know whether she's, she's with us on this one or not, um, organizing crypto parties basically is a tool of community empowerment. So rather than waiting for some politician to come along and fix things for us, we're going to take power into our own hands. So whether it's at that very individual level about whether we're using signal on our phones, whether we're communicating in encrypted ways, whether we've kind of taken a measure of agency back in our own communities like that, or whether we're using tech tools um, to organize more broadly uh, and to push back and to create organized campaigns to push back. There is hope and these things aren't always juggernauts. And again, to come back to the facial recognition this, this whole facial recognition capability, that was knocked back last October up to a point by the committee that just traditionally waves these things through because of how bad it was. So there is hope in organising um, movements against these things. Yeah, I would encourage people as well, um, if they've got questions um, from the audience to whack them in the um, chats. I think I've got one from Lucy, but I was just going to throw to um, Vanessa before I had a look at some of these questions and pulled them in. Um, Vanessa, you know, Scott was then talking about friendly 
technologists, which I would consider you one. Um, so always willing to explain the technology aspects of um, particular ideas or projects to those from non-technical backgrounds. Surely you're not the only one. I assume that, can you tell us a bit about what you think is, um, how the tech community responds to these things? Do you think there's more openness to collaboration perhaps than there was before? And um, I know that technologists do seem to be coming a bit bit more radical around these questions and a bit more critical of um, what might otherwise have seen been seen as benign projects put on by government or, or large tech co companies. What's your view about how technologists themselves are organising or being prepared to organise with others uh, in defence of human rights? I don't know why this has suddenly happened now, um, but it's great that it has. It's not organised, I should say. It's completely, um, it's a bunch of different people all looking at it in their own little homes uh, and fiddling with what they've got on their own uh, setup and kind of chatting with each other. So um, I agree very much with what Scott said about the importance of just kind of grabbing it and doing what we think is important with it. And uh, I love the idea of the tech community helping um, everybody else to do likewise. Uh, I agree, Asher Wolf has been great. Uh, Stilette Dreyfus for years and years and years has spent a whole lot of time uh, explaining to journalists how to use tech to defend the uh, security of their communications and so on. So I definitely think this is the way forward. Uh, anyone who has a nice suggestion of what I should build now that I'm uh, now that I haven't got a day job anymore should uh, please send it, send suggestions into the chat. <laughs> I have a few ideas but I'm open to refinement. Um, I think if you haven't been out of Australia you don't realise how unusual it is internationally that techies are almost until very recently absent from public debate. If you go to the United States or Western Europe, there's a very active, often very loud community, um, often part of, often kind of intersecting with the crypto and security research community of people who examine stuff. Australia has an unusual number of restrictive laws compared to other democracies that restrict free communication about cryptography. We nearly had a law banning re-identification of public data, which is about as mad as a law against going near a nuclear facility with a Geiger counter, <laughs> right? Uh, we have, um, it's not an accident that we don't have very effective open free communication in this country about tech we have a lot of laws that potentially make it a crime yeah i mean i, I point out as well that I, I believe it's still in the legislation that it's there's a prohibition on re-identification of data that might um have been collected or stored as a result of uh, use of the COVID safe app um which we tried to agitate against. It was certainly in the first draft um, and uh, it struck me again, like it does take a long time to teach these people who are responsible for passing our laws why these things are a mistake. They come at it with a particular mode of thinking and they're always very hostile to the idea of openness and transparency and being told of their errors, um, which is something that uh, we often have to bear the consequences of as the general public. Um, I did see a question there from Lucy in the, um, in the chat box and maybe I'll, I'll um, throw it a heron to talk about it because we were talking a little bit more about welfare before. So how do we um, work with vulnerable people and communities to build a counter narrative around some of these questions? Like one of the things that I noticed um, in relation to um, the robo debt scandal was that of course it took many years to uh, Prove to the government that they were doing an unlawful thing in uh, sending out these debt notices. Much, a huge amount of work from activists, um, from lawyers as well, but lo lots of technical people involved, very broad, broad campaign. And then it ended with a uh, um, press conference in a park on the Gold Coast on Friday afternoon. Uh, and while there's been some um, kind of attempts by the media to hold the government accountable for that uh, three quarter of a billion dollar Oh, I'm, I'm loath to call it an error because actually it was a huge burden imposed on some of the most vulnerable people in society to have to 
to address that problem. Um, but they're, they're mistaken in that policy making field. And I guess I wanted to, to bring you in here and to see what you thought about how best can we organise to build counter narratives around both the idea that um, social welfare is in crisis or that it's full of people who um, misuse it, uh, but also that these people have rights and dignity and are entitled to um, be treated with respect. And that includes respecting their privacy. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's been quite a lot of discussion in uh, the media and Twitter, which I have just sort of become a bit active on the last couple of weeks. It's a frightening place in some ways. Uh, but there's a lot of discussion uh, amongst both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the wider community about this idea of allies. And I think that's really important because, you know, I don't have any technical background. Uh, you know, a lot of these communities have got limited access to people that can provide technical expertise and support. And so I think, you know, a great starting point would be, uh, you know, creating um, sort of alliances or relationships between, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and communities and people that could help us uh, with the insights that we might need, that we don't know that we need about what the issues are and and maybe how those issues can be uh, advocated with both sort of the technical aspects but also the community-based aspects. So I think that's really important that it's very easy for somebody to sort of throw a lot of technical jargon at you and say, well, what you're complaining about, it's not a legitimate complaint when you don't have the knowledge to kind of meet that critique or that criticism. And likewise, the technical people might be saying, well, this is really unfair for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And they might be met with, well, you're not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, so how do you know? And this person said this. So it then makes it very easy when you haven't got that unified kind of front with all sets of expertise that you need to meet the sort of the, the sort of the various um, responses, excuses, defences that might be thrown at you. So I think... Um, those kind of alliances, there's a really great opportunity um, for new sort of friendships to be made and to use those then um, and the strength of, of those friendships to, um, yeah, to advance the interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might otherwise um, not be able to advocate in terms of those particular issues, whatever they might be. Um, uh, a call for us all to remember librarians there in the chat, which I absolutely agree with. I think librarians are some of the most important people in the world. So um, a resource there for us to, to draw upon, and I think that's correct. Um, it's, I, I love the way you put that, Heron, to talk about uh, making new friendships. I think that's a, um, uh, both articulate and accurate, I think, uh, agenda for, that we need to achieve to be able to be successful. Um, what do you think, Scott, what do you think we need to do so that next time one of these either crises hit or um, opportunities arise for governments to push out a project or a piece of legislation that we don't want like, and you, you talked about facial recognition there, I think it's probably the next thing that's coming. Um, I should say, because Peter Dutton's bill was rejected and I think he's probably working on drafting it again. And I would say Digital Rights Watch is, um, is hoping to very soon launch a campaign on this issue and I encourage everybody in this Zoom to, to get on board and help us uh, push that out because we think there's a real opportunity there to talk about this at this moment. What would you think success would look like um, the next time one of these opportunities or crises hit, Scott, that can help us um, be more successful at holding government to account? I think, um, so Christine Milne used to, used to say um, that in a crisis, the first person with a plan on a table wins. And I, I really took that to heart because politics is just a series of crises ch chained together. And we see that happen over and over again. Um, and power structures are very good at exploiting them. They will create crises so that they can exploit them. And I think what we need to do is be ready, is be the ones with the plan on the table when the next crisis happens. I mean, we're right in the middle of a series of them at the moment. With facial recognition, yeah, the, the work that Digital Rights Watch and some of the other advocates do on that is tremendously powerful. Um, I was reminded actually just before we came um, online, Andrew Hasty, who's the chair of that committee that knocked back the facial recognition bill this time, 
said the committee is broadly supportive of the objectives of the bill. So what, we're, what government is doing behind the scenes is having an argument about what kind of hideously dystopian mesh together facial recognition AI um, disaster is appropriate. What checks and balances should we put around that? Which is, it, I'm, I'm delighted that it brought us potentially a few months of a reprieve, but it's the wrong conversation to be having. Um, anything that we can do to popularise the places around the world with they simply banned this technology. I think we're losing you, Scott. Being deployed. It's a total disaster. I'm sure, I'm sure Scott was making a brilliant point there, but I might just... Um, I might just... Uh, um, I might just move on being while we out strong, to get I think connection what working out. again. Um, so what I was going to yeah. say is that it's interesting putting it in defensive terms like that, responding to the next crisis. But Heron, as um, I'm a lawyer and you've got a legal background as well, I just wanted to get a pitch in to talk about um, a potential Human Rights Act for Australia. One of the reasons is I think a lot of these crises might be filtered through the language of human rights now, the concepts of human rights, if we had an act. And... I don't know if it comes as a surprise to anyone in the room today, but um, you know we are the only um, the only Western nation, at least, without a Bill of Rights. Uh, we stand apart from many similar countries with uh, liberal democracies and a liberal democratic tradition. Do you think a Human Rights Act would make a difference, or, or what's your view in that regard? Yeah, look, I think well, as I'm a lawyer, uh, one of the things, and I think the the reason the robo debt. I think that it, it sort of all came to the head was that there was a class action that was happening. And that's my own, that's my own opinion, but it sort of felt like once there was some legal pressure that came to bear, then there was a political response that was different. So I think the law can be a really useful tool for bringing about change uh, and bringing about pressure. The Human Rights Act, it's interesting. In Queensland, we just got our Human Rights Act this year. So... Some other states do have human rights acts, but you're right in that there isn't one that applies across all Australians. It depends on what state you live in as to whether you have the benefit of the Human Rights Act. They're also very new, so they haven't been tested, but we can look to the benefits that have been derived in other countries, you know, like Canada, where there's a better sense of, okay, it might change, hey, but might change behaviour immediately, but people get used to what the expectations are and what the law requires, and therefore the community behaviour and the behaviour of institutions and others does start to shift because everyone thinks, okay, well, we can't do those things anymore, and so you don't need the enforcement of the legislation so much. Uh, you know, racial discrimination might be an example. Sex discrimination might be an example. Now that the acts have been around for a few decades, people generally understand, well, you can't do that anymore. And if you do that, you're breaking the law. So uh, the good thing is that it's a start that some jurisdictions have the Human Rights Act and we hope that they can have a lot of uh, important benefits, but we don't quite know. And also not everybody in Australia has the benefit of of those. So I think there really is a need for us to look more seriously at something that covers all Australians and doesn't discriminate depending on where you live. Mm. Yeah, completely. I mean, I think as a Victorian as well, we've had a Victorian Human Rights Act, which I think is... Yes, brought, you do. Yeah, brought a lot of good. I think we were probably uh, just after ACT, so we're the second mm. jurisdiction. And um, I think there's been a lot of utility in some respects. It's also highlighted some of the uh, gaps that exist too. Um, and not just that some things are governed by federal government, but also just gaps in how human rights works on the ground for people, because you need lawyers to enforce rights as well. You need decision makers that can make decisions in a timely fashion. Um, you need to have the language and capacity to access those systems of decision making. So there's a lot to do around it. But, um, you know, even just thinking about the protest that happened in New South Wales, um, uh, that was banned at one point and then overturned. I sort of wonder if, um, and that was a movement in support of um, 
movement, you know, the, the, it was part of the Black Lives Matter movement. It was a solidarity protest, but also about Indigenous deaths in custody and over policing of um, minority communities. And I think, uh, you know, that question might have been thought of differently, not just by judges, but also the public, if we thought about the right to protest and freedom of association as a right that was enshrined in our legal system. It might not be a total solution, but I like to think that that kind of framing does assist us to answer these questions, not just through the lens that politicians choose to apply uh, and that they try and control the narrative um, that human rights might work to, to undermine that a bit and allow a broad based public discussion. I might just see if I can get Scott back because I rudely cut him off speaking of freedom of um, freedom of speech being one of those human rights. Did you want to finish what you were saying Scott? I don't know how much you caught but no it's okay. Um, I was just wanting to underline what others have already said. We just need to be organised and not wait for the next crisis. Great. Um, okay, so I've got another question here in the comments. Um, uh, it's become apparent that these projects, these apps are being built by people and agencies either unwilling or unable to see how they'll be combined together and um, and the gravity then of the decisions that are made, being made in the design process. So talking here about digital identity, facial recognition and things like the COVID Safe app. Um, how do we make sure we hold these programs to account before they're released? Vanessa, I might throw to you. Um, what do you think people who are working in these agencies think about these things? Do you think they see the capacity for them to be all drawn together? How do we get into the mind of those designers from a technical perspective at least? acknowledging that there's other ways to do it um, to help them understand the gravity perhaps of the decisions they're making. Hmm. I don't know. Um, but I don't, in some ways I don't really care, actually. I would go back to what Scott said and say uh, it's up to the citizens of a democracy to push back upon them. Uh, uh, if you know that your face is going to be uh, turned into what Scott accurately described as a dystopian database, then wear a Peter Dutton mask to the Black Lives Matter uh, rally when you go next time, right? We don't have to put up with these things just because somebody thinks it's a clever idea. Uh, facial recognition isn't particularly effective even in ideal circumstances. It's definitely not effective if you're wearing a snorkeling mask and a, um, you know, surgical mask over your face. I think we can take a leaf out of the book of the Hong Kong protesters who are accustomed to being the uh, targeted by one of the most invasive surveillance states on the planet. You don't have to take it lying down just because somebody who was designing it thought that it would be fabulous. I think you've just come up with a merch idea there, Vanessa, which is we need to make a dozen masks that everyone can wear to Black Lives Matter protests. That would be um, amazing. I mean, horrifying. Uh, but amazing. Yeah, and one of our, um, in the chat pointed out that there is actually um, anti-mask laws that are regulations that have been imposed, which I think is interesting because they clearly think this is a threat. I mean, I sort of, I never encourage non-compliance with the law, but I think the more people who are wearing masks in an anti-mask area, the harder it is to enforce those, those regulations, I suppose, is what I would say. I mean, I think it's an interesting question because often we sort of default back to thinking, oh, you know, technologists are the ones who build this, therefore they're the ones responsible. But I, I take the point, of course, that it's a much, um, a much bigger question than just who's designing it, who's got their hands on the, the design questions and that there's legal ones as well. Um, yeah, um, I suppose, I don't know whether you've got anything to say about that, um, Heron. I just sort of also think as a lawyer, it's always a question of, um, of thinking about how we can introduce law so it doesn't come down to just a designer or just a public servant who's got a particular policy to enforce. But I think that's because I'm a hammer and everything looks like a nail. But is that also your view as a, as a, as a lawyer? Yeah, I think, I'm not sure if I got the gist of your question, but um, I believe... Well, I shouldn't say this, but I don't always agree with complying with the law because sometimes the law is not, I don't think it's right. And so, I, I don't know. <laughs> I know this is being recorded, but I think, you know, like in Australia, there's an assumption that all the laws are good and they're all beneficial, but sometimes laws aren't. And, and I think that's really the very point of this discussion that, just because a law is made, it doesn't mean that the people that made it did a good job or made a good decision. And mm. if we don't agree with that, then we have to make that plain. And that's why we have law reform commissions in all of our states and nationally, because 
you know, and the ACCC did a digital platforms report. And now because of that, there's reviews happening around the privacy legislation, around, you know, competition, around complaints mechanisms and the use of the Australian Communications and Media Authority. So I think you have to start from the assumption that, you know, the law is useful, but also that it's not right because it's made by humans and humans aren't perfect. So there's always, it's always important for us to, I think, see that as a starting point. And I, 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 I don't know if I missed the point of your question, but I was Oh, of, no. I mean, I that, think that's, that, that sounds like a very sensible response. I suppose my worry sometimes is when we talk about technical things or technological protests, pro projects, we can assume that it's technologists that need to hold the line and that if they've built this technology, they're responsible for it. And I guess I sort of see it slightly differently, which is we're all collectively responsible for trying to get the laws in place that you're talking about that are actually holding companies to account, holding governments to account rather than relying on techn technologists or, or people managing these projects internally. Um, I mean, I think they've got a role to play, of course, but, um, and some of the activism we've seen from people working in companies and um, whistleblowers from government, they're, they're profoundly important. But I agree with you. It's sort of on us to, to agitate for the reform rather than expect that technologists will be the last line of defence against projects that are um, in breach of, of human rights. Yeah, if I, um, sorry, if I could just add mm. one last bit. Yeah, I think one of the things that has happened is technology has become increasingly complex. So one of the things is that once upon a time, everyone knew how to use te technology because it was quite basic and now it's become quite complicated and only small groups of people know how to use some part of technology. And so I think information sharing and education for the general population becomes that much more important so that we can then use that information to Kind of understand where the problems lie and what they might be and i think that's something that um yeah that has become increasingly problematic over time sorry to monopolize that there but i'm finished now <laughs> you're very much entitled to monopolize that that's why we invited you to come and be on our panel um i do note the time though and so i am going to wrap it up but i just wanted to thank uh, both all our panelists. We're very grateful for your time and your contributions. It makes a big difference, I think, to kind of make friends across these different fields in exactly the way that you described before here. And um, to thank uh, people who are participating. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions, uh, either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, as I said, I hope that we can hold other events like this. And we do expect to be launching a campaign on facial recognition technology, particularly at this moment, um, in which that technology is under scrutiny um, and, and companies are starting to question it, as well as governments. Um, Scott's there holding up a copy of my book. Uh, I'll pay him for that advertisement later. Um, <laughs> we're all looking forward to reading his book when it comes out. Um, thank you so much for coming. Hope to see you soon, whether it's in your inbox or uh, in another one of these sessions. Um, yeah, keep up the fight.